Scripture reading for tonight is 2 Timothy <coughs> chapter 4, verses 6 through 18. 2 Timothy 4, 6 through 18. For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day, and not to me only, but unto all them that love his appearing. Do thy diligence to come shortly unto me. For do thy diligence to come shortly to, unto me. For Demoth has forsaken me, hath left this present world, and is departed unto Thessalonica, Cretans to Galatia, Timothus to Dalmatia. Only Luke was with me. Take Mark and bring him with thee, for he is profitable to me for the ministry. For Tychicus have I sent unto to Ephesus. The cloak that I left at Troas with Carpus, when thou comest, bring with thee and the books, but especially the parchments. Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. The Lord reward him according to his works, of whom be thou aware also, for he hath greatly withstood our words. At my first answer no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me, and that by me the preaching might be fully known and that all the Gentiles might hear. And I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Good evening, everyone. It's uh, good to be back out tonight. It's good to see everyone here tonight. And tonight what we're going to be talking about is the passage that we just read is some people that were in Paul's life. Uh, these, these folks that he mentions were people that he had met along the way, that he'd met along his, his journey in his, in his ministry. And I think that all of us, you know, not, not any one of us don't have any friends. You know, all of us have people in our lives. All of us have have met people and, and we've uh, cultivated relationships with them. We, we rely on certain individuals and, you know, we have those that we consider, you know, not our friends. We consider them, you know, enemies. They, they actively work against us. And, and we see here um, in your Bibles, it might also have the same uh, separation there. The, the title of this section is Paul's Valedictory. Uh, this is the last letter that he wrote. These are the last few words that he penned before his martyrdom, before he was martyred for the cause. He was killed for the cause of Christ. And so here he is reaching out. This is his last message. And he says all of these things. And with our own lives being as, as frail as they are, you know, something that we should constantly think about is, is this kind of thing, is, is how he's looking at it, that the message is built upon relationships that we have with those out there in this world. And we should develop those relationships and we should do as much as we can with those folks that allow us into their lives. And tonight my technology is failing me. I usually have my phone up here, but it wouldn't load my PowerPoint for some reason. So I'm relying on that screen back there tonight. <clears throat> but, you know, we, we have these, these things and... Uh, you know, some of the people that uh, are in our lives, they impact our life temporarily. Some of the things uh, that uh, I remember as I was, uh, you know, my, getting my first job, you know, there's people that worked at Burger King. They, they would come and they would go. Same thing with Walmart. They would enter in. They would go be there for about a week or two, and then they're gone. And you would hope that, you know, in your presence and the, the, your demeanor and the way that you talk and the way that you act and the, the things that you try to engage in, with them about, you know, would perhaps impact them and cause them to stay and continue to work and that this could be a good place, a good environment, all those things. But do we do that with the church? 
You know, we do that with our friends at school. We do that with, you know, our, our coworkers because we're kind of stuck with those individuals day in and day out. Do that with our church family. Do we encourage people to, to join us at church as well? We want to have an impact on the people that are around us. You know, uh, thinking about uh, an individual that has tried to push so many individuals away out of their life. And, you know, you can't blame um, this person for, for everything. You know, sometimes uh, life gets us down. This individual, you know, was telling me how uh, everything that took place during COVID really stressed them out. You know, they, they had a lot of pressure put upon them for the, their job that they had, and then so many people felt like abandoned them and left them alone. And their coping mechanism was not a good one. It was not a good choice. They then relied in their uh, solitude on drinking to cope. And this has, you know, taken place and, and has led to the action that just took place uh, last night where this individual tried to end their life through means of alcohol and drugs and tried to overdose. And meanwhile, you go onto their Facebook page and you see all of these things where they're just like constantly pushing people out, pushing people out. We don't want people to be pushed out of our lives. Instead, we, we see Paul, as these individuals are taking off, he's wanting people to join him. He's wanting people to encourage him. And so we need to do that as well. And we need to see these individuals and, and hope that uh, while we have breath, while we have life, we can impact them for the better. And tonight, as we go through this lesson, there's three points that I'd like us to think about as we talk about this message tonight is that we need to be pulling our friends closer. We do need to be able to identify our enemies. And we need to remember that God will never forsake you. He'll never forsake me. So I hope that this message helps us out in some way tonight. The first thing that I'd like to look at is read the the verses here again, just starting at verse 6. It says, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, at the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give me on that day. And not to me only, but also to all those who have loved his appearing. Like I said, Paul is about to be martyred. He's at the end of his life. And this individual that I talked to, the same way. You know, this, this was a conversation that I, I just had had with this individual. That when it comes to religion, their idea about religion is that, uh, you know, this, this individual has, has, has believed and has been uh, baptized uh, with a sprinkling. And I was trying to talk with them about how that's not, that's not what the Bible talks about. That's not what the scriptures indicate. And I was told, well, Jesus went away to prepare many rooms. You know, this, and, and the gate says, you know, in, in Revelation it says there's four gates. And there's many ways into, the, into heaven. And, and that whenever we all get there and they're in their room that has been prepared for them and we're in our room that's been prepared for us, I can come over and say hi and they'll come over and say hi. And I'm like, that's not how it works. <laughs> that's, not, that's not the message. And we see that Paul has this security in his salvation. And I was trying to point out, you don't have that security. You're you're risking everything on a gamble. But we see that he has this security. And why does he have that security? Well, because of all the things that he had done in his life. You know, everything that he did in his life. He, He did so much for the cause of Christ, after trying to tear it down. But he expresses that hope. He says that he has fought that good fight. He has finished the race. He has kept the faith. He has done his work. You know, we've we've had a lesson about Paul. And we've gone and we've looked at all the things that he did, how how many times he was beaten for, uh, 
for the cause of Christ? How many times was he you know, uh, imprisoned? How many times was he shipwrecked? How many times uh, for all of these things? The, the times that he was beaten, that he took 40 lashes minus one. So he was hit, beaten 39 times. I believe it was three on three occasions that this took place. And you would think that just after the first lashing that he received, that as he gets the second set of these lashings, that as they would open that up, that they would see those scars. And then after he gets the, receives the, 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 his last set of these things, as, as they're opening that up, and, and as you would see those scars, you know, I, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie uh, for, uh, first, first Blood, right? Uh, the Rambo movie, where he uh, goes into town and, and they, they beat him up and you know, he's, he's trying to plead his case beto- uh, before the town jury, and he goes over, and they had messed his stomach up. They had, they had drew on his stomach with a knife. And all he does, he doesn't say anything, but he just goes up to the jury and just walks with his shirt up so that way they could see the scars that are on him. And it was gruesome. I remember being like, whoa, that's awful. That's terrible. And that was just from one encounter. But Paul was beaten multiple times. What did he look like? He had been deformed for the cause of Christ. But that didn't deter him. He continued to go and be faithful to the Lord. Because he knows that and, lo- and, and waits for his appearing. He wants that crown of righteousness. And he knows that he must do what God wants him to do. What Christ instructs him to do in order to obtain that. But he goes through and he, he talks about these folks that he wants in his life. But this first po- person here, he says, you know, be diligent, come to me quickly. Demas has forsaken me. Having loved this present world and having departed for Thessalonica, Demas took off on him. This was somebody that wasn't necessarily there for him. And Paul was let down by this. You can imagine that as he's here and all of these people are leaving him, Luke is the only one left. As it says in uh, oh, verse 10, was it? Verse 11, only Luke is with me. Everyone else had abandoned him. But this individual, he, he, he was feeling distraught. He was feeling distressed. He's writing his last words. He's about to be killed for the cause of Christ. And he's being abandoned. Let's turn to Matthew chapter 13. Verses 3 through 6. He says, He spoke many things to them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell by the wayside, and the birds came and devoured them. Some fell on stony places where they did not have much earth, and they immediately sprang up because they had no depth of earth. But when the sun was up and were scorched because they had no root, they withered away. Demas was like this. He had no root. He loved the things of this life more, and that's what caused him to run away, to go away, to leave. He was a, he, he was a, a lover of this pl- uh, present earth. This morning in class, as we were back there, we were talking about some, uh, some of those things uh, along these same lines. The study this morning was about having a desire for Christ. And we talked about the rich young ruler and how he uh, came to Jesus and he's like, what else do I need to do? I, I've done all of these things. I've, 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 you know, I've got all my check boxes done. I fulfilled the law. Well, what did Jesus tell him? Go sell all that you have. Give that to the poor and come follow me. His response to that? He went, went away sorrowful. Because he had many great things and he wasn't willing to give those things up. He was, he was more concerned about the things, the pleasures of this life, rather than following after Christ. Doing his will. Obeying him. Are we the same way? Do we have folks in our lives that we see that are like this? Have we been abandoned in this way? Do we abandon others because of this? We have to be careful. We have to be cautious. We have to be purposeful. And we have to desire Christ and following after Him. We have to desire to work for Him. 
But there will be those like this. There will be people like this, unfortunately. We all need that friend like Luke. Let's turn to uh, 2 Timothy, back to 2 Timothy. Only Luke is with me. And we, we think about that. And this is why I need my phone up here. I'm feel, feeling a little lost. Um, but only Luke is with him. How many times have we been abandoned by everyone else? But then there's that one person. Again, this makes me think of this situation. You know, this is a, fam- a, a friend of the family. And this afternoon, I called my dad up because last night, he went down there to where this person is. And I asked him, okay, you know, because he, he said that he'd been on the phone with a, a sister and a brother and the other sister as well. And I'm like, well, have, has anybody else come into town yet? Well, no, my, my, my sister came in, you know, so, well, his sister, my, my Aunt Debbie went in and my cousin Mindy went in, but nobody else from her family. And it's very sad, isn't it? It's very emotional, you think, after this person tried to end their own life and nobody's going to them. Why is that? They've been abandoned. There's only one person there with them. We need somebody like that in our lives that's, that's dedicated not only to the cause of Christ, but also dedicated to us and helping us along the way. Do we do that for our Christian family? Do we hang with them through thick and thin, no matter what happens. Luke had been with Paul for many of his missions. Whenever he was going about and he was uh, preaching the word to all of these different areas, trying to establish Christ's church, Luke was with him on many of those occasions. He was a close and dear friend for him. And he received comfort because of that. Think of how much that meant to Paul. Think of how much that would mean to each and every single one of us if we had that one friend that we could rely on through everything. Let's read Proverbs chapter 18 and verse 24. It says, A man who has friends must himself be friendly, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. Sometimes, sometimes it, it's more than just those earthly ties of family that bond us together. Sometimes there's more to life than that. And even though, again, bringing the, the situation up with this friend of the, uh, of, of the family, even though nobody else is there, even though nobody from their family is there, there is still a close friend that has come by to be with them, sticking closer than family. And yet they still try to push everyone away. So we see John Mark as well had come into Peter's li- or Paul's life. And we know that they had a disagreement. We know that there was uh, something that happened with John Mark that he ab- abandoned uh, uh, one of those missionary journeys that, that Paul was on. And whenever he was trying to be reintroduced, he's, and uh, Barnabas was saying, hey, you know, let's bring John Mark with us, right? Paul's like, absolutely not. He abandoned us. He abandoned the work. I will not, I'll not go through that again. But we see that here, he's asking for him to come back. He's saying, please, get Mark and bring him with you. He's useful to me for the ministry. Do we have people in our life that we think of that we we can imagine saying that person would be good for this. And we want to give them some encouragement as well. Please bring, come here. Come to me. Get close to me. I want to, to tell you something. I want to encourage you as well. And that's what he's trying to do with Mark. He's trying to encourage him before he leaves. This wasn't somebody that was his enemy. 
At one point in time, it is almost as if he considered him that. He considered him an enemy of, of, for the cause of Christ because he abandoned the work. But this is somebody that's not a true enemy. He no longer is pushing this individual away, but he's trying to draw him near. He's trying to draw him in. The passages that are there, let's turn to Acts chapter 12 and, and verse 25, where it shows that all, all of these things taking place. Acts chapter 12 and verse 25. It says, And John was finishing this course. He said, Who do you think I am? I am not he. But behold, there is one that comes after me whose uh, sandals I'm not... And that is not the right verse. Am I in the right chapter? I'm in chapter 13. <clears throat> chapter 12, verse 25. It says, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry. They also took with them John, Mark, John, whose surname was Mark. And let's turn over to 13, verse 13. It says, Now Paul and his party set sail from uh, Paphos, and they came to uh, Perga and Pamphylia, and John, departing with them, returned to Jerusalem. So we see that, that he returned uh, to Jerusalem. He left. He departed from him at this point. And then uh, going to chapter 15, Starting in verse 36, it says, After some days Paul said to Barnabas, Let us now go back and visit our brother in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark, but Paul insisted that they should not take uh, with them the one who had departed and left them in Pamphylia. They had not gone with him to the work. Then the contention became so sharp that they parted from one another. And so Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. But Paul chose Silas and departed, being commended by the brethren to the grace of God. We see here that, uh, and it says that he went to Samaria and, the, and Sicilia, strengthening the churches. So he still went on. This individual came back. He was useful for the cause of Christ. Whatever it was that took place, it was a temporary situation, and he was able to overcome it. Sometimes we have moments like that in our life. And I pray that that's what's going on with this individual. When I was talking to my dad the, today, he's like, I. I feel like maybe this is why I was put into their life. Because nobody else is here. Nobody else is here for them. Maybe this is why we're together. Maybe that's why I'm here. That way I can encourage them and strengthen them so that way they don't give up. And so that way they do uh, come back and they do... All right. There, that's better. Now you guys can hear me. <clears throat> so, getting back on track, the... Um, Maybe that's why, you know, that's why he was saying, he's like, maybe this is why, so that way they can come back to the, uh, to the fold. Maybe they can realize what, what the truth is and that there are people that truly care about them and not just about, you know, them personally, but about their soul and about their salvation, about their eternal, you know, either punishment or eternal reward for what they have done in this life. You know, we have enough real enemies. We don't need to continue to push somebody away. We don't need to continue to, to have those kinds of things. You know, as uh, Paul continues on, he talks about a real enemy in his life. He talks about Alexander, the cop coppersmith, who opposed him, who opposed him greatly. Starting in verse 14, it says, Alexander, the coppersmith, did me much harm. May the Lord repay him according to his works. You also must be aware of, beware of him. For he greatly resisted our words. People are going to be set against us. There are some people that are very much set against the cause of Christ. As I've mentioned before, you know, going through and you can find all kinds of things. And what I've become very interested in is the debates that take place about 
you know, defending Christ, some apologetics. And there's people that promote atheism and they get up on stage and, and they are very, you know, hard-headed and they're, they're, they're very uh, well-versed as far as, you know, theology is concerned, but they don't, even when it is proved to them time and time again, they continue to hold fast to their skepticism. They continue to go out and try to drive a wedge between Christ and people. They continue to do those things, and that's terrible, and it's a shame, because it's so evident that it's true. That's what Alexander is doing. He's trying to cause contention with the brethren, trying to cause them to lose their faith, trying to cause them pain at every turn and every corner. That's what he did with Paul. And we might have people like that in our own lives. Where no matter what we do, no matter what we say, no matter how we act, how we behave, how we treat them, they continue to push us. They continue to try and harm us. They continue to try and be a thorn in our side. Maybe we've had neighbors like that. I remember growing up, we did. We had a neighbor that was constantly trying to uh, cause problems with us, calling the, the law on us because we mowed you know, uh, three inches onto their ground. And you would think... <laughs> Well, we're doing you a favor, right, by mowing a little bit of yours. But it was just the silliest things. And they were constantly trying to, to just cause us headaches. We have enough real enemies. And we have to understand that there are some people that are enemies of Christ. And that there will be people who present lessons that are grievances to God. That are against the scriptures. People take things out of context all the time and present it as fact, as truth. And it misleads so many people. As I mentioned earlier, this individual had been misled. And now it's very difficult to, at least from my point of view, to teach them and say, no, this is what the scriptures truly say. Will, will, you, will you read this? Will you learn this? Will you... Take what Jesus says as if he meant it. Don't allow people to drive a wedge between you and Christ. Identify those individuals. Mark those individuals so that way they cause you no more strife. Or so that way whenever you do encounter them, you, like the skeptic against Christianity, you're a skeptic against what they say. And that they don't drive a wedge between you and our loving Father. Nehemiah. <clears throat> In Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 2. I'm going to have to try and find this. I like, my study Bible has a lot more room for error for me. It has about five extra pages per book. Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 2. It says that uh, Sanballat and Geshem sent to me saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages the, of the plain of Ono that they, uh, they thought to do me harm. You know, there was all of these people, there was this conspire, uh, conspiracy against Nehemiah. They were trying to oppress him. They were trying to do him harm. And all he was trying to do was encourage them. All he was trying to do was tell them to remember God and to obey God, to bring them back to God. But they tried to cause him problems. There's so many people in our lives that try to cause us problems when we try to remind them that we have a God that we should serve and we look out into nature and we try to prove God's existence through the evidence that we see. But they say no. And they, drive a, they try to drive a wedge. We see that even though people tried to drive a wedge between Paul and God, they were unsuccessful. Get back to 2 Timothy chapter 4. It says uh, in verse 16, At my first defense, no one stood with me, but all forsook me. All forsake, forsook me. May it not be charged against them. 
But the Lord stood with me and strengthened me so that the message might be preached fully through me and that all the Gentiles might hear. Also, I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And the Lord will deliver me from every evil work and preserve me for his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Paul's life was a, was a great testimony of faith. It was a great work. On that road to Damascus, as Ananias was even inquiring, Lord, don't you know who this man is? And the Lord was like, yeah, I know exactly who this man is. And I'm going to show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul did. Paul suffered for Christ's sake. And we see that the Lord delivered him that day. You know, he often equates Satan as a lion, as a roaring lion waiting to pounce and devour us. He was delivered from the mouth of the lion. And because of Paul, his ministry was towards the Gentiles. His ministry was for us. And that we could also be delivered from the mouth of the one that would devour us. Because of the Lord. He's there for us. He can strengthen us. He strengthened Paul throughout all of those things. If we take time to study the life of Paul, we notice how many times he had been beaten But he got right back up because of the strength of the Lord. He had that infirmity of the flesh that he prayed to be, to, to be removed from him. But the answer was what? No. Why? Because then he could rely on the strength of Christ. That he wasn't doing those things because of his own strength, but through the strength of God. And the Lord delivered him. And he had, uh, as we read earlier, He had security. He knew that he had that crown of righteousness waiting for him. And won't that be the best thing ever? You know, we're not promised to not suffer. We're not promised that, you know, once we become Christians that everything's hunky-dory, everything's great, everything's grand. We'll have no suffering. We'll have no pain. That's not promised to us in this life. But it is promised to us in heaven. And as he was going to be suffering his death, when he closed his eyes last, being full of pain and agony, and then he knew what the answer was going to be when he opened his eyes up. Well done, a good and faithful servant. That's, he knew that was going to happen. Do we have that same security tonight? If you don't, if you have yet to put on Christ in baptism, would you consider that? If you have questions, please get with us so we can t- discuss it. You know, my plans this week are to, to go to this preacher training, but at the drop of a hat, I'll come back and do a study if anybody wants to. No matter t- what time it is. I don't have any other responsibilities. I'm bachelor this week, so anytime. And for that matter, even when the kids are around, anytime. We'll study so that way you can learn about Christ. So that way you can have salvation through Christ. That's the only way. If you have put them on in baptism, but you need the prayers of the congregation, the invitation is yours as well. If you have need of the gospel call tonight, please come let us know what we can do to help and take a seat on the front as we stand and sing the invitation.